His stage five win came at just the right time. Yeah, we're back in contention. Not that we were out of contention. It's just good to be near the front and, and keep pushing along to be able to, yeah, try and still, uh, yeah, push for that for that outright win. The man they're all trying to catch is Speedy Gonzalez. Honda have led the rally before, but this year, are they ready to win it outright? The truth is, the Honda has the potential to win this rally. I believe in Honda, and they believe in me. Right now, the belief is working. He leads the Dakar in Bolivia. Today, it's the longest special of this year's Dakar, and not once does it drop below 3,200 metres in its 542 kilometres. Tough beyond compare. And our old friend, the Salar de Uni, provides the backdrop for the day. It's cold up there. Riders did what they could to fend off the chill, as the sun took its time to warm the vast and barren lands that border a uni. Cold and altitude combined are the perfect storm for mistakes. And Bereda was the first to suffer misfortune, his bike expiring on him. We found him with his teammate Paolo Cecchi desperately trying to fix the machine at kilometre 203. More bad news struck the Husqvarna team as Ruben Faria crashed early in the stage, breaking his wrist. The Portuguese rider was airlifted from the stage and said a premature goodbye to his Dakar 2016. He joins Ivan Jaquez on the sidelines after the Slovakian called time on his race with a damaged knee. It wasn't a great day for Kevin Benavidez either as he lost 15 minutes on the long stage. But as lots of other riders lost similar time, he only dropped one place overall to seven. It was a very interesting stage for Sherco rider Alain Duclos. Having kept a low profile over the marathon stage, he finished 14th today after running in the top 10 for most of the stage. But he's best equipped to tell you why his day was quite so tough. Just before getting to the second refueling, I crashed on my left side. Nothing serious, but I made a hole in my tank, and it's connected to the rear tank. So I took off with a full tank of gasoline leaking on my boot. So the last 120 kilometers seemed extremely long. Antoine Mio got lost at kilometer 30 and lost nearly six minutes in that off-track excursion. After that, he played a little bit safe to make sure he got to the end in one piece, rather than risk making another mistake and losing a chunk of time. Still, 12 minutes loss is a lot. He wasn't alone though. Stefan Svitko was with Mio when the two took the wrong course, but Svitko pushed harder on the day, coming home in fourth, and he's fourth overall. After that mistake, he matched the pace of the leaders all the way to the end. Paolo Gonçalves, the race leader, rode a lot with Juan Pedrero. Back and forth, they switched positions, but Pedrero started nine minutes ahead of him, so Gonçalves certainly wasn't hanging around. He was in the lead of the stage all the way to checkpoint three. But then that changed. Oof, the head. Wow. Eric? Oof. Yesterday, uh, at the end of the stage, a lot. And today, oof. I don't know exactly what is happened with the Barreda, but uh, if uh, he are uh, now out of the, the fighting for the, the victory, uh, I think uh, also if Ruben is out of the fighting, uh, also we have uh, more than six riders to, to fight, so it's an interesting uh, race. And uh, I will try to do my best day by day. Austrian Matthias Walkner has built his speed over the last three long days. Today, he sat in the dust of Mio after they met when looking for waypoints. He did get past when the Frenchman went off on the wrong tracks 160 kilometers later. The big KTM rider felt the day's exertions in the last 80 Ks, but that was where he overtook Gonçalves in the times for second, and his best stage of the rally so far to get him to third overall. Toby Price became the first man to lead out and win a stage on the rally this year. Impressive, considering the scale of the task. He actually crashed into a spectator's car, only 30k in, that cost him his pace. But in the second half, he was so fast that he gained over a minute on Gonçalves to win. 
Once we start getting into this into this first week and uh, the second week when the fatigue kicks in a little bit, that's when it uh, these little things go wrong. And then plus the bikes have been been through a lot already in the first week. So uh, yeah, I think it's um, it's going to be pretty difficult uh, to get to the finish line of this one. The the pace of the the first week we've had so far has been has been up there pretty high. So. Uh, Compared to what last year's Dakar was, uh, the, the pace of that first week wasn't wasn't that strong. But uh, yeah, we're we're doing the best we can, and uh, as long as we minimise mistakes, we'll, we'll be sh we should be pretty good. Safe for Price, a flag to flag win. His winning margin, one minute and five over Matthias Walkner, his teammate Gonzalez, the best of the Hondas, surprisingly in third, just a few seconds back. Svitko, great ride from him, that keeps him high in the standings, in fourth place still. But it's Paolo Gonzalez that still leads the way, but the gap to Price is now only 35 seconds. But for the second Honda, Bereda, he's being towed by his teammate. His day is not done, but his chance of Dakar victory surely is. The big news of the Quaz is that Rafael Sonic has left the Dakar. The 2015 winner got back to the Bubba Wagon. The Mal Motos is being won by Jürgen van der Gorberg. The former MotoGP rider is determined to right his loss of 2015 and did a very strong marathon stage, coming in 58th place. Though every day is a marathon for these guys. The battle is going to be very close for the category this year as Manuel Lucchese is 54th overall, four minutes behind van der Gorberg. It's time for an update on the T2 category, and it's Nicolas Gibon in the Toyota leading the way. Gibon managed to finish the last part of the marathon stage in 32nd position and sits 35th overall. Around one hour down in the overall classification is his former co-pilot, Akira Miura, who's now 46th and 2nd in T2. It's not very often that you hear the high-pitched ring of a two-stroke engine in Rally Raid, but this year we have one, and it's not a big one. Sylvain Espinas has decided to try his hand at riding a 125cc Husqvarna for the 9000Ks for the Dakar. The bike prepared by RS Concepts is an experiment to prove that a small capacity two-stroke can survive the extreme conditions. So far it can. Espinas started today in 101st place. Do you have any oil? Here you do repairs, right? Oil for the brakes. For the brakes. Do you have it? of the special stage in Bolivia. We just arrived. It's packed of people coming to see us. Welcome to Dakar. We're uh, at stage seven today, uh, going from Unity to Salta. Um, it's going to be a difficult stage going into the riverbeds and uh, probably we're going to come across a bit of water too. So hope you look forward to it. Today, we say goodbye to Bolivia. But there are still a few surprises in store before we leave the marvelous country. We've had three wonderful days in the majestic countryside of Bolivia. It's the longest time the Dakar has spent exploring the country and tested the endurance of the riders as much as it rewarded with its unique hospitality.
Previously in the bikes, the intense altitude in Bolivia began to take its toll. And even the world's best began to suffer on yesterday's long stage. Oh. Oof, the head. Wow. Yesterday, uh, the end of the stage, a lot. And today, oof. Gonçalves held his lead, but Price won the day and has closed right onto the heels of the Honda. Is the Australian ready to take the overall lead? As a racer, you always want to win and you always want to be on that top step. For sure, it, it, it all looks good on paper, but um, anything can happen between now and then. And things did happen. Ruben Farrier crashed hard and was airlifted out. And Joan Bereda hit serious trouble. Will the Honda rider go any further on this year's Dakar? Once the race was over yesterday, Ruben Faria made it back to the bivouac after his nasty crash on the stage. Battered and bruised, but still smiling. Just. The Husqvarna rider had had a day to forget, and he'll take his time to get over the broken bones and his damaged lip. Just before 9 p.m., Bereda made it back to the bivouac after running more than 250 kilometers as a dead weight behind his teammate. He was at least back with the mechanics to try and fix the bike, but the mood in the Honda camp was somber. Today was a hard day with the bike breaking, but it's something that happens in sport, the crazy nature of racing, because we started so well, but, well, it is what it is. The final irony, the bike was fixed, but a damaged hand was the final blow to his race. For today, our last day in Bolivia, the special stage splits into two sections as we race back towards Argentina and the rest day in Salta. Bolivia once again was ready to give the bikes a fantastic pre-dawn send-off. And President Evo Morales took his opportunity to see the race off. <laughs> Through the drivers, the Dakar unites the Bolivian people. The poor forget about poverty, the rich about wealth. Everything is thanks to the Dakar. We're really proud to have this race, to have drivers that come from the five continents of the world. And this is historic for my country. The second man off today into the Potosi region was Matthias Walkner, started, as many of the top riders were, by Ivo Morales himself. Just 17 kilometers into the stage, drama unfolded. As the third man on the stage, Paolo Gonçalves, came across the stranded form of Orkner. The Austrian flung fully 20 foot clear of his bike. The bike was barely scratched, but Walkner himself was left with a broken femur. The medical helicopter was on its way. <laughs> Eventually, his teammates Quintanilla and Aranja arrived to look after him while Gonçalves rejoined the race, and the first of the medical assistants arrived. Time for something a bit more fun. Two fast young Dakar rookies having fun on today's stage. Ricky Bravek racing to seventh over the full stage distance. And Adrian Van Beveren had good fun and a good day, but was caught out by the late developments. More on those later.
Toby Price rode on today, oblivious to the drama that unfolded with his teammate until he got to the end of the first part of the stage. Opening the road for the second day was more costly for the big Australian, but he rode at the front all day to come home sixth. Fifth place today was Helder Rodriguez. He assumed a de facto second on the road behind Price and stayed there all day long, closing two minutes on the KTM rider and doing his overall standing the power of good, just behind Michel Metz. Kevin Benavides had a stormer today. Starting 18th, he's blazed his way past three other riders on the road to come in third overall. It was good timing for Benavides. He'd seen his podium hopes dissipate in Bolivia. The day's winner, that was Anton Mio. He got his first ever special win, his sixth full stage. The gap, three minutes and change to second. But what of Gonçalves? He rejoined the race behind Rodriguez and quickly put the drama behind him after getting back the 10 minutes 53 he spent attending to Walkner. He finished the day second and extended his lead over Price overall. It was okay at the start. Then, after 300 metres, it started to rain really hard in the second part, and all the track was turning white. It got very slippery, tricky. But then, after a while, after a few kilometres, it went back to normal, and I could ride without problems. But once the top 20 were through that beginning of the second part, the race was stopped when a river flooded and became impassable for anyone. So the results are taken from that point, from everyone, from the end of the first part of the special. So Mio has it, but in second place it will be Paolo Gonçalves once he gets his time back. Kevin Benavides credited with it for now, head of Mecha Rodriguez and Toby Price losing four minutes to Mio. And it's Price with the overall at the moment, but that will all change when Gonçalves gets his time back. Today was another hard day on the Dakar for the quad competitors. Average altitude was a shade over three and a half thousand meters. The Bolivian heights were expected by all and feared by some, and the podium ceremony in uni did not mark the end of the suffering. It was merely a baseline to deal with. Everything is slower and harder to do when altitude sickness hits. This year, the medical staff of the Dakar have taken care of more than 300 people suffering from different symptoms. And some of those races didn't even reach the end of stage six. Do you understand why I was staying on the bike? Are you going to fix that on my bike as well? <laughs> I'm going to take your blood pressure and check how you're feeling, OK? We can't tell him to stop right away. We'll try to be careful. Well, OK. It's really not reasonable to continue like this. When you arrived, your face was really blue, very blue, and it means you missed a lot of oxygen. It's really too dangerous, and you'll be all by yourself. And we're a long way from the bivouac. You've reached the red zone, and there's nothing we can do for you. You have to be reasonable. You have to stop. You can't go on like this. It's impossible. You give yourself a lot of goals to come here. And when you're there, the only one is to finish. You don't care about the classification. If you want to finish the Dakar. I don't feel any anger. That's a part of dream. I even had pleasure and pain. You have to accept it, be reasonable. Doing the Dakar is not reasonable. Here in Bolivia, stuck in my tent because there's a giant sandstorm going on outside. You can see the tents moving around like crazy. And there's sand coming in my tent everywhere. It's in my teeth and it's in my sleeping bag. It's everywhere. <clears throat> so it's going to be a good night.
Okay. Does anyone have any tape? Yeah, tape. Okay. And it's the beautiful city of Salta that hosts the rest day today. Hard earned for all the crews that have made it here. It's been tough, but a large majority of the bivouac has made it to Salta. The service crews themselves only arrived late last night from Bolivia. And there's a sense that time is not of the essence today. As the stories of the week past are swapped and essential maintenance done to make sure everyone's ready for the coming challenges. We join our bike racers in Salta after a strange but very long week of racing. And our first board of call is Honda. Right now, they lead the rally. The number two of Paolo Gonçalves has excelled this week, especially when things got tough, even if the first stage run was a bit tricky for the Portuguese rider. The second Honda rider is Argentine sensation Kevin Benavides. What a debut it's been for the young rider in his first Dakar even winning stage three outright. As he often is, Joan Bereda was the man to beat in the first week of the rally, piling on the speed on the fast stages like a greyhound chasing a rabbit. It's cost him though. First in speeding penalties, then in a broken bike on the longest stage around a uni. Precisely what happened last year has happened this year. But it doesn't change our objective for the Dakar, which is to go and get that win for Honda. Obviously, that's something that's always really difficult to do, but that's what we're going to try and do, and do that every day. Obviously, with Joanne having problems, it makes it a bit tougher going for that victory, because it's just me, but I'm still confident that we can do it because that's what we came here to do. The new Husqvarna team have had it rough too. Pella Rene, the rookie, crashing on stage four. And his teammate, the more experienced Ruben Freer, also had a tough race. After his early pace, he crashed hard on stage six, breaking his wrist and smashing two of his front teeth on the roadbook mount. That's left the team with one rider flying the flag, Pablo Quintanilla. And even though he's yet to win a stage, he's proven very consistent for his new team. The number four rider now sits fourth, 18 minutes off the lead. The truth is, I wanted to be inside the top 10 by the time we got to the rest day. It's been pretty hard for me because this terrain really isn't my favorite. But the important thing is that I'm here safe. The bike is in good condition, no injuries, no crashes, which is good because now the hardest and most intense part of the rally is to come. KTM are having a mixed bag, showing just how tough the long stages have been. But despite a crash on the first day of the marathon, Stefan Svitko has always been at the front and finds himself fulfilling his own objectives in third overall. Unsurprisingly, Laia Sanz is leading the women's class, but more than that, she's 15th overall after seven stages, despite a couple of small crashes. She's still in with a shout of recreating her ninth place from last year. There were hopes for Walkner, but after his great debut last year, it all ended as he crashed yesterday. It's a big blow to his and KTM's title hopes. 
The de facto team leader is now Toby Price as he's best placed in second. The only rider to lead start to finish and win a stage in 2016, the Australian trails Gonsalves by just over three minutes. But as usual, he's pretty content with his own performance. It's been a, been a tough week. Uh, it's been a really high speed, high pace um, course so far and everyone's been on the gas. So it's uh, a little bit different from last year's Dakar, but we're making good navigation, um, which yeah, is, is a big bonus. So we, at least yeah, now we're, the confidence is up, but yeah, all in all, it, uh, it can be taken away pretty quick with one, one wrong error, but uh, we're doing the best we can and having a good time. So that's the main thing. We can't finish without some of the outstanding rookies of the race so far. And we'll start with Antoine Mio, perhaps expected considering his racing pedigree. One stage win already is not to be sniffed at and he's well inside the top 10 in sixth. We've done the easiest bit of the Dakar, I think, even if the last two days have been quite tough. Physically, I'm feeling well. I didn't crash, I didn't damage the bike. For the moment, everything is fine. We'll see at the end. Make a summary at the finish. For the moment, step by step, I'm getting close to the podium. Despite my bad start on the prologue, I'm getting closer to where I want to be. It's interesting. It's always great to get American Baja riders on the Dakar, and the latest is Honda protege Ricky Brabeck. The big Californian has bounced his way to 12th overall, only 38 minutes from the top. Just two places back is another debutant making an impact. Adrian Van Beveren was quick to start with fourth in the prologue. And though he's lacked pace on the longer stages, he's had fun all the way. So it is Gonsalves that leads by 3 minute 12 from Price, Fitco in third, and those three are clear at the moment. Quintanilla slowly moved up 18 minutes back in fourth, ahead of Benavides in fifth. Mayo, Rodriguez, Fares, Duclos now 30 minutes back, losing quite a lot of time ahead of his teammate, Juan Pedrero. A quick nod to the Malamoto category, where last year's run-up, Jürgen van der Gorberg, is currently leading. The Dutch rider is 46th overall, with a nearly one-hour lead to his name. Four riders lined up as favourites in the quads, and two were the Patronelli brothers. We come here for a Dakar, not as tourists. Strong words, but defending champ Sonic had a different view from the two Argentinians. I will just go on my path. Sonic's path, though, ended in Bolivia with the broken clutch. An early race leader, Casale, also left the race before halfway. South African ace Brian Baragwanath caused a stir with his speed, but the mistakes are just a bit too frequent for the rookie. It's been great to feature this year. Uh, I've had four podiums so far. Um, it's, it's, it's a great feeling to be running at the top. Uh, just unfortunately got some penalties uh, for late starts and, and one or two admin issues. So that's been my big mistake so far. The second of the Patronelli brothers, Alejandro, had a slow start to the rally. He even crashed hard on the third day, but two wins in stage six and seven have done his chances the power of good. The other brother has consistently finished higher. Marcos has yet to win a stage though, and for him too, errors have crept in. The surprise of the first week is 24-year-old Russian Sergei Karyakin in his third Dakar. He's back after failing to finish last year, and four daily podiums in four stages, including a stage five win, put him as the only challenger to the Patronelli brothers. And there's confirmation. Alejandro leading from Marcos. Three minutes, 36 to gap. Karyakin still in touch in third. Gonzalez has got work to do ahead of Hernandez. How do you feel now? Mm. Very cold. At over 4,000 metres, 
The conditions have become extreme on the Dakar. With that, he'll be hot. Put that in your gloves. It's going to heat up. While Cobra's pot guide was able to continue his adventure, Frenchman Sebastian Soudé was left stranded. I hope someone friendly will stop and tow me to the finish. I could then change my engine. I would be given a penalty, but at least I could finish my Dakar. That's all I can wait for. But my chances are reducing. One guy stopped, but he didn't have any brakes. He said, if I pull you, we won't be able to stop. To add to his despair, the dark skies began to threaten. Three years of training, three years. This is my second. On my first Dakar, I quit after two days because of the heat. And on this one, everything was going well, no problems. I was riding at a fairly slow pace, but it's the same story again. The Dakar will once again be cruel to Sebastian Soudé. It's the end of story for the Frenchman. Earlier, but Kevin Benavides is truly a sensation on this year's Dakar. To be in Argentina gives me more energy and strength thanks to the support of the people. It's a dream to be on the Dakar and to live these days it was beautiful until now. For his debut on the rally, it's been a fairy tale from the biker who lives in Salta. For me, the Dakar is the toughest race in the world and a great challenge. As soon as day three, he'd already conquered his first success. Riding bikes runs in the veins of the Benavides family. All my family is concerned by motorsports. My dad was a bike racer and I started riding because of him. My brother also competes and so does my sister. All the family loves bikes. Fast and spectacular. Kevin Benavides, he won the De Sofia Guarani last year, giving him access to the Dakar, is learning extremely quickly. Everything is difficult on the Dakar. It was difficult for me to learn navigation, and I trained all year for that. The race is also very hard and long. You need to be physically strong with a clear mind. Fifth overall on his Honda, the rider who just turned 27 could well be inspired by the performance of Toby Price, who was third last year in his first appearance, although the podium is not his main focus. I just want to ride without pressure. It's my first year, it's my debut. I don't want to add pressure. I prefer to enjoy myself than to think of a final position. On terrain he knows off by heart, Benavides now needs to stay strong to answer the expectations of an entire nation. President, thank you for organizing such a great event. Thank you for welcoming us. It's the best way to expose your country. Everything is so well organized.